Hi, Katie. So nice to see you again. Hello. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time zone. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm so excited to be here and to speak with you. Um, I am the uh, VP of Digital here at Involve Media. Just going to do a quick introduction on my end and Katie's. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Involve Media, we do everything from strategy to um, execution, optimization, and measurement across various verticals. Um, and I personally oversee the programmatic, search, social, and uh, influencer marketing here at Involve. And Katie, I know many people already know who you are, but please take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us how your career has taken you to your current role at US Bank. Yeah, hey everybody, thank you so much for having me. My name is Katie Berry. I am the agency relations director at US Bank, so based out of Minneapolis. Um, US Bank is the fifth largest bank in the US. We also have operations in Europe, and I work as our agency relations director. So I manage all of our external partners. Um, there's a whole bunch that goes into that. Um, and previously have managed paid social media for US Bank, have also managed branded content for US Bank. I've been there for seven years, and before that I was at United Health Group, so did a lot with talent acquisition marketing there. Also a lot with M&A. So um, I've always done marketing. I, it's definitely kind of my, my favorite thing to do. That's awesome. And Katie, I know um, just looking at your background, your educational background specifically is just so impressive from marketing law to master's in public policy. Can you tell us a little bit about how, um, what inspired you, how you chose to uh, stay in the career in marketing specifically? Um, how did you get through the challenges that we all face with our, within our career, especially being women in, in marketing? Yeah, well, I think it is, um, this might sound kind of a little bit controversial, but I think it's harder to be a woman in finance than a woman in marketing. And I say that because I have backgrounds in both. So I actually studied both finance and marketing communications in school. And I did a marketing internship after my sophomore year of college, and then a finance internship after my junior year. And I just found that I just hated the finance environment. Um, it was just very male dominated. It wasn't welcoming. Um, it was just a lot of spreadsheet crunching. And so so what I found is actually, I found that it's ironic that after all this time now, I've ended up working in marketing at a financial institution. So kind of having the best of both worlds. Um, but I agree. I think that one of the things that we've really had to focus on is just making both finance and marketing just more inclusive, right? And, and making it more welcoming. Um, and so I feel that now I think that we are getting to a place where um, hopefully teams are just doing a better job of communicating, letting people be their authentic selves at work. Um, and so I'm very happy that, that I stuck with marketing. I do work in finance a little Little bit, but I think overall, I just find that it that it's a great it's a great area, and, and that marketers I think can really shape financial organizations as well, um, just because we lead with empathy, authenticity, sometimes a little bit of a sense of humor. Um, so I think that we really are kind of a linchpin. I think that we bring a lot of light um, and and kind of hopefulness and and hopefully some joy to to finance as well. That might have sounded a little hokey, but I, but that's sort of how I like to think of us. So I like to think of us as kind of as kind of forces for good within financial organizations. No, definitely. I think, you know, you made a really good point with the differentiating finance from marketing and how every um, industry just has its own niche and nuances that no one else knows until you're actually in the seat and really understand what those are. It's kind of like not knowing what you don't know. So I really appreciate you kind of um, showing us what that difference is and just speaking to it. And that being said, I'm just curious, do you, did you have any um, mentors or leaders that you looked up to in your journey um, through your career? Yeah, so one of my internship in, in grad school um, mentors, she was my boss, and she was just incredibly well liked. She was a journalist, um, and then had moved to actually state government, which is where I was interning at the time. And I just was like, what is her secret sauce? Why is she so well liked? Um, and not that she wasn't lovely. But what I really think her secret sauce was was listening. I think that a lot of people want to jump in and talk or interrupt, right? Um, or they're multitasking, or you know, you're you're kind of listening on a call, but you're not really engaged. And so what I found is that when you can really 
really listen to people, make them feel heard, say, you know, especially in challenging situations, hey, I understand the problems, either here's what I'm going to do to try to troubleshoot and solve them, or here's honestly, just to be really transparent, I don't know that I can solve this problem. And here's kind of the background on why we're, why we're in this space to begin with, how we got here and, and kind of maybe how we can work through it. But to be really honest, this problem is not going to be solved. Um, but just being really mindful about being a good listener. Um, she really kind of taught me that. I think we're in a world where not everybody does active listening. And even I sometimes feel guilty of, you know, oh, I'm going to multitask on the side. But people can feel that. Um, so I think she kind of took that journalistic background, that listening, pulling out stories, and that contributed to her success. And now, I'm super lucky. I have several mentors, but I also have a, a sponsor within US Bank. And this woman has put me up for jobs that maybe I didn't think I could do. So if, if you go out and, and look at my LinkedIn, I actually had never managed agencies before I took on this role. Um, I had I had worked at an agency, but had not managed them. And, and so I was like, you know what? I bet that I can do this because she has faith in me. So I think just having somebody have faith in you, having them give you stretch assignments, even stretch potential career roles to sort of set you up for that next step. I'm very, very grateful for that. And, and I sort of do that as well. Now, when I look to hire people, I think, you know what, I bet this person can do this, or this person has the soft skills, the emotional intelligence. I bet they could learn some of the hard skills that they may be missing. So um, I'm very, very grateful to have a sponsor. And, and I always encourage people to have both mentors and sponsors, but I think sponsors Sponsors, especially in finance, can really be those ones that elevate your career to that next step. That makes so much sense. I think, you know, having that support is so important. And I love the point that you made of just active listening. That is just so important, especially as people managers and working collaboratively in teams and groups, not only just listening, but hearing what people are saying and kind of reading between the lines. It's not really just answering the question that is being asked, but also understanding why that question is being asked and answering it with all the right information. So, um, and then of course, I love the, the point that you made about being stretched and just having the right mentor, the right sponsor to give you the opportunities that um, allowed you to grow. And that's so important, I think, in every um, path, every career that we are on is just having that opportunity to take on projects that we're not, um, exactly comfortable in, but we are able to take on and grow. And as um, I read a quote somewhere that said, you know, um, we don't grow without discomfort. So it's in the uncomfortable that we become better and stronger. So um, greatly, um, I greatly appreciate that. I love that. So um, just talking about your role specifically as a director of agency relations, can you tell us a little bit more about like your day to day, what are the nuances that no one um, else might, kn might know who is not in, in your shoes? Yeah. And what are some of the challenges that you have to deal with on a regular basis? Absolutely. And I did just want to say one more thing I forgot to say about mentors that I, that I always advise people is getting mentors in your organization, even if you're in like a small nonprofit, which I've worked at, getting mentors that are not in marketing, that are not on your team, that you can just bounce ideas off of, right? Like, hey, does this seem weird to you? Or what do you think about this? Um, because I've had mentors that have don't know any of the players within my organization. Um, and I had one woman and she was like, yeah, you absolutely should be making more. You need to ask for a raise. And she's like, I never start my employees below blah 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 and so I just find that like you can be really vulnerable and open with somebody who doesn't know anything about your department so I always say you know find a find a random mentor as well um, somebody that doesn't know know the players and sort of your department but getting back to my day-to-day my day-to-day -day is a lot of risk management. We are in finance, so it's a lot of managing the, they're called TPRs, third-party risk records. Um, so I have to manage all of the ins and outs of that. I also manage all of our finance and budgeting. So it's it's forecasting all of our agency projects. And then I manage all of the retainers. So all of the scopes of work with all of the different agencies that falls under me as well. Um, but really a lot of what I do is the interpersonal management. So it's, it's sort of being an interface between um, our business lines and, and US Bank and then the agencies. And so I have regular touch bases with each of our agency partners and, and just sort of say, hey, you know, here's kind of the good, the bad, the ugly. Hopefully we spend a lot of time on the good and the great. Um, but what I found that I, that I thought was really interesting is actually agencies have said, hey, we don't always work with clients that have someone in your role. And we actually really like having an interface. We like being able to complain to you about 
U.S. Bank as a client, right? Like they can come to me and be like, U.S. Bank's terrible. They're, di they're disorganized or, or whatever that may be. Um, or they're not giving us clear feedback. And then I can also go to them and say, hey, you know what? Your creative team just missed the mark here. You know, this just isn't working. And, and I always say it in, you know, in, the, in a thoughtful way. It's not like I just say the work was terrible. Um, but that's a lot of it. It's just having difficult, courageous conversations. And what I would say is the most difficult part of my job in, the, in kind of the last two years is, first off, it's a really tight budget environment, right? Right? We know that kind of, you know, I know marketing budgets kind of across the board, we're having to fight for those dollars and then in turn our agencies face tight budgets. So that's, that's been difficult. But what I would say is the bigger challenge actually is, is agency retention and hiring. So you might have a fantastic team, you love them, you love your account lead, you love your strategist or your creative director, and then that person leaves for another opportunity. So agencies have had to sort of plug in the gaps. So sometimes agencies have had capacity issues and that's been hard because I'm like, we have a retainer. I have all this work. You don't have capacity. That's a difficult, that's a difficult thing. Um, and also just when you, when you lose somebody that you love, right. It's sort of, you know, I don't want to call it the great resignation. I just think that people are making a lot of changes. Um, and with those changes come a lot of agency turnover. So i um, not to pick on anyone who's listening, who's at an agency um, change is a part of life. U.S. banks also had a lot of turnover. I think a lot of companies have, even if they're great companies, to work for but that's hard because you have a good relationship they know your brand and, the, and then they leave and, and sort of you have to pick up those pieces got it got it and uh when you're saying um when working with different agencies and the turnover that happens and as you need to vet new agencies do you have um have you come up with like an innovative process that you put into place that kind of helps you choose and select who you would be working with and ensure that that's a collaborative process that everyone is uh kind of bought into yeah, so I work with my my procurement partner, Double P's, and I what I really like is that we actually do when we have RFPs, we actually do a blind scoring. So this person gets scorecards from everybody that could be impacted, right? So you might have an EVP or an SVP, obviously sitting in on the pitch, but then you have people that will be sort of those day to day employees working with that agency day in day out. Everybody gives a score across all of these set criteria. The cri criteria themselves never change. There's a set spreadsheet scorecard, you will give that your individual scores to my procurement partner. And then he comes up, we meet afterwards, and he does a blind scorecard sharing. So he has sort of each of the categories who scored the highest and their overall highest score. Um, but we don't have any of the names. And because I don't always talk to everybody after the pitch, I don't know who who wrote what. Um, but what I really like about that is that typically the, the agency that scored the highest is, is kind of the winner. We don't exactly know who we're picking. Um, that sounds kind kind of silly. And then he reveals kind of, hey, here's the names. And obviously, once those names are revealed, there is always time to to change, right? If, if it's like somebody's just like, this just doesn't work, we could change. But typically, what I find is that that highest scored agency wins. And what I like is that that's very equitable. You don't have sort of like one EVP that has one horse in the race, right? Maybe there's an EVP and they happen to have a friend or a neighbor that owns an agency, right? And so it sort of tips the scales. That doesn't happen because it's a blind scorecard. And, and I don't know who said what because we only see those overall total scores. Um, the other thing that I really like is looking at any new business or, or any new need now, we must have. Um, a diverse vendor in the consideration set. So we, we cannot proceed with an RFP unless we have a diverse vendor included, um, which I think is very important. And that can be defined as a woman-owned business owner, a BIPOC or a veteran-owned business owner. Um, and obviously they, they'll have that official either federal or state designation. Um, but we worked a lot to increase our supplier diversity. It definitely was a weakness of ours four or five years ago. Um, so I'm very proud of those efforts and, and just sort of um, how we're able to come to consensus building decisions. That's so amazing to hear. I know inclusivity is so important these days and just giving everyone a fair voice as well. So it's great to hear that. Um, that's awesome. And then um, just uh, the way you process everything to ensure that everyone, even at the different levels of um, the organizational hierarchy, everyone has a say. And um, that's great. Uh, we try to do that internally as well to give everyone a fair voice and ensure that everyone has a say in any decisions that we make as well. So well, a lot of times your specialist is who actually ends up working with them day to day. You know, like an EVP or an SVP is like, I want this agency, which is fine. 
But then actually that specialist or that manager, they're going to work with them for months, potentially years, you know, and, and so kind of they reap the benefit of a good partner, but they also reap sort of the punishment if, if somebody just is like not a good fit, but, you know, the loudest voice in the room or the highest paced voice in the room, um, you know, sort of made the call. And, and hopefully that doesn't come across as cynical, um, but I have also been young in my career and like, how did we get here? How are we working with this partner? Um, but, you know, it's just like this person very high up wanted this, this agency. And, and here's how we net it out. That is so true. It's always the specialists who work in a day, day in and day out and know all the ins and outs of all the nuances and um, all the particulars and who is uh, working well and who isn't. So they, they really should have a voice and in, in a choice of who we're working with. And even um, throughout the process or throughout our lifetime working with a partner, we usually always have um, evaluation cr um, criteria and timeframes when we do kind of do a scorecard and reassess to ensure that everyone is still happy with the process. So um, that's Absolutely. so important to do uh, and to ensure that everything is running smoothly. Yep, and I do those <clears throat> by twice a year for our largest partners, once a year for our smaller partners. Um, and I do, I, I solicit feedback from everybody, right? Because depending on where you are in the company, you have very different perspectives of agencies. So um, just like you might do a 360 degree peer review, um, I do those for our agencies as well. And, and even I learn things where it's like, oh man, I didn't know that the agency felt that way about us, or I didn't know that this person felt that way about the agency. And so it just definitely helps us sort of, um, move forward positively, but I also add, if this is okay to be a little bit negative, clear out any bad blood, right? If there was bad blood on the agency side or a specific business line felt like they didn't get the work they wanted, um, you know, we can sort of clear the air, which I always think is good. Right, that's, that's awesome. Um, switching gears a little bit. So talking about um, passions outside of work. I know we talked before about um, some other projects that you work on, and you mentioned that you're currently teaching um, digital strategy as an adjunct professor. Tell us a little more about, um, about that and your passions, and how do you um, balance a full schedule? I know I, that's a big challenge with um, a lot of women in, uh, in business overall, in marketing and finance especially, so I would love to hear your feedback. Yeah, I have a little secret. I'm here as agency relations director of US Bank, but my real passion is teaching. Um, and it's okay, my boss knows, other people know. Um, and I think one of the things that I've learned is, you know, as, as the pandemic started, I just sort of said, you know, is the grass always greener elsewhere or do I just need other things to fill my cup? And so I was very, very lucky. So I applied to the University of Minnesota um, to teach digital strategy and I, and I was accepted and hired on as an adjunct. So I teach undergraduate digital strategy at the University of Minnesota. I also teach MBA digital strategy at a, a smaller university in St. Paul. Um, and I absolutely love it. And I've been very grateful. So I went to my boss at US Bank and just said, hey, you know, I just need more. I need to feel more um, like I'm giving back to the community. I need to give sort of an outlet um, where I'm able to just sort of make a bigger difference. But I said, I, I don't want to leave US Bank. I don't want to just, you know, leave and, you know, I, odds are knowing me, I'd probably want to crawl back to US Bank in a year or a year and a half anyways, um, because it is a really great place to work and I have a lot of friends there. Um, and so what I was able to do was actually flex my schedule. So class times are in the afternoons. They're not after four or five o'clock. Um, and so what I do is I, is I start early and then during the semester I teach and then I finish up my day later. So I'm very, very lucky that I'm able to flex that. Um, and what I would say there is if you feel like you're, you're just not happy or not thriving, you know, maybe you do need to go and look elsewhere. Maybe you need to leave your company. But I think that really knowing sort of turnover and, and people aren't looking to lose good employees, I also also think it's okay to have a courageous conversation and say to your manager or your mentor or your sponsor, hey, I need more. Like this just isn't working for me. Um, my passions aren't being fulfilled as much as I would like them to be. I, I found this other opportunity, you know, can we make it work? So I was very grateful that my manager was gracious enough to do that. Um, but what I've actually found is that teaching digital strategies actually made me a better digital strategist and a better marketer because they keep me on my toes. Um, brands like Celsius energy drinks or, or Gymshark, right? Some of the brands that may be in brand innovator conferences and panels. I've learned a lot about different brands. I've learned sort of what um, is intriguing to Gen Z. And I also bring in trends every week. So I'm actually more on top of my game just as a result of teaching. So being able to pursue that passion has also elevated my own career. Um, and so that's been very gratifying. And then outside of work, I just try to really um, keep good work-life balance. So I don't have email on my phone. Um, so I work really, really hard 
hard when I'm here. I'm fully present, give my best. Um, but then on nights and weekends, because I don't have my laptop up, I have no way of being contacted. Obviously, if something blows up, people can text me. Of course, it's not like this is an iron gate. Um, but I found that that really lets me unplug and unwind. And then I come back in the morning refreshed, ready to jump in and give my best. So um, I know that that does not work for a lot of people, but it's just I found um, in previous jobs, especially when I worked internationally, it was kind of hard for me to set boundaries. Um, I will admit I was bad at that. So in taking email off my phone, I found that it's easier for me to be more present in that personal side of my life. Um, and that's worked well for me. I know that that's not something that a lot of people would do. It's a little funky when I'm traveling. Like I'm like, you have to text me. I, I don't get email unless I have my laptop up, but I don't regret it. I found that it, it sort of really makes my weekends my own, which I'm very grateful for. That's so amazing. I think it's just the key is finding what works for each one of us and, uh, and really kind of honing in, honing in on it. And um, I just wanted to touch on the, the passion point that you had made and how that just following your passion made you a better um, kind of more fulfilled worker. And that is so true. I mean, we all are driven by our passions and if we feel unfulfilled then our productivity goes down. So it's so important. And I, completely um, agree and align with, with what you said. So really happy to hear that we're, we have that flexibility and we're more so opening up to that flexibility, especially after the pandemic and just seeing that um, opportunity for so many people being able to kind of have that uh, flexible schedule and people kind of exploring more than just the day-to-day -day work and finding their passions. And it's great when we can combine it together, just like how you've done it. Um, and it's like, my passion is managing people. So it's like, I, as a manager, I, I love, that's part of my job that gives me passion. So it's so amazing when the two kind of come together and, and make us want to go to work every morning. So, um, and then when we have amazing teams to work with, that just a cherry on top. <laughs> Exactly. And I mean, think about how selfish I am. I can promote U.S. Bank to these students, promote them for internships. You know, maybe I'm just also selfishly filling my employee pipeline. And there is just for the record, there is no preference to any students or anything in internships. Um, everything goes through campus relations, so I don't have sway there. But, you know, it's just also ability to sort of get people to think about careers. And we actually do one of the things that students have really responded to is actually I do a career day and I talk through here's what it's like at an agency. Here's what it's like at a small company. Or, or a nonprofit, or here's what it's like at a large company. Um, and we talk about kind of the pros and cons. And even one of the things that we talk about is student loans. And I say, you know, here are the types of areas where you can make a higher starting salary. Here's where you're going to make a little bit less. What is your personal financial picture look like? So um, I found the students just really, really respond to that. Um, I have a practicum, so it's not theoretical. Um, and, you know, just having kind of really, here's some things you might want to think about as you start your career. Um, because I feel like when I was going to school, well, people didn't say things like, do you have student loan debt? Would that change maybe your first step out of college? Um, that just wasn't really talked about. And so I, I find that, you know, it's not just what are you passionate about? What do you like? But there, there's pros and cons and good reasons to pursue um, any number of career paths, especially when you're when you're just starting off. Yeah, definitely. Well, speaking of passions, um, are you passionate about any specific digital channel or do you find more of a cross channel strategy as your passion? Because I know for me, I couldn't pick one channel. Everyone has its own pluses and minuses, its own nuances and perks. And, um, and I love putting together just a holistic cross channel, multi-touch approach for our clients. And usually that's what the business it needs in order to reach their objectives, just that multi-touch experience through the buyer journey. So I'm curious, like, what are you passionate about? Any one specific or any, um, any platform, any tactic? Would love to hear that from you. Yeah, I'm cross channel all day long. And I even think that there's some what I consider like sleeper channels, direct mail still actually works, right? We can track that to see like, oh, actually, this direct mail piece, which um, the stats say that direct mail reaches in, in the sense of like is viewed by less than 1% of its intended target. But that 1% that engages, um, I myself get stuff like I got something from Stitch Fix. And they're like, hey, we want to see you back. Here's a coupon. And I'm like, you know what, I can use a little wardrobe refresh, right? So I'm not above direct mail. Um, email marketing, right? 
I think sometimes we we focus so much on flashy channels and obviously, you know, emerging darlings like TikTok are emerging and doing fantastic for a reason. Um, but really thinking about, you know, what is that total channel philosophy and strategy? Who is that target? Um, and nobody consumes anything in a vacuum anymore. So um, I think it I think it's very interesting. And, and one of the things that really interests me now is sort of the separation between people that can opt out of ads across everything, right? Uh, Hulu, for example, Peacock, Spotify, and then people that do receive ads, right? I'm also very intrigued by what Netflix is going to do. We saw that Netflix just had a, a partnership with Microsoft, which just announced. Um, so I'm very intrigued to see kind of what, what Netflix advertising will look like. Um, but I do think it is, it is very interesting. It feels like audiences are getting more fragmented, um, it just in terms of kind of uh, U.S. bank targeting an emerging affluent or, or an affluent audience, you know, the channels that they're on and, and their ability to not have ads, you know, definitely forces you to be a little bit more creative um, than sort of a, a general market where, you know, people like myself, for example, you know, I still have ads on, on certain platforms. I, I don't really mind. I'll, I'll just look at my phone for the next 90 minutes, which I know is terrible to say as an advertiser, um, but, you know, I'll look at my phone for the next 90 seconds a, until the show's back on. Got it. And Katie, going back to uh, fintech specifically, what are, I know we've talked earlier about regulations and they're always something that's changing that you have to stay on top of. I know for us, for example, a lot of our clients are always concerned with brand safety. So we ensure that we use like best in class technology, um, that we use premium supply inventory and build specific uh, brand specific lists just to kind of get ahead of that. Um, but what are some of the um, compliance challenges that you face and how do you solve for them? Yeah, I think the biggest compliance challenge we have is just how long it takes us to get through compliance because there's just so many different steps. So we have our, our creative is reviewed by risk to make sure that we have all the relevant disclosures, right? That could be equal housing lender, member FDIC. Um, if it's wealth management or, or US bank investments, we have even more disclosures. Um, so making sure that all of our disclosures are, are um, done properly, making sure that things are in large enough font. If it's a video, making sure that the disclosure stays up for enough seconds right, all of those regulations. Um, but we also have our targeting reviewed by an organization within U.S. Bank called FARB, Fair and Responsible Banking. And so what they're looking at is, is the targeting equitable? Is the targeting the opposite, meaning predatory targeting? And sometimes how, where we net out with them is they say, you know what, you need to make your targeting more generic. You need to have more general marketing targeting. You can't just target the specific segment, right? Um, or if you target a specific segment and, and layer on, um, you know, interest targeting, for example, they're like, no, you can't do that. Um, we, we don't target by things like specific zip codes, anything like that. Um, ever since Meta reached, reached, you know, that housing employment credit targeting, we take that approach sort of across the board. Um, but getting targeting approved is, is kind of that the second layer once the creative looks good. Um, and then the third layer is if it is in, not in English, we have a, we have an organization called Translation Governance that makes sure that all of our, all of our creative is also appropriate, both culturally appropriate, but also from a risk perspective, right? Does the language which itself makes sense. So there's sort of three pieces of the pie that we have to go through along with just the general proofreading. Um, but one of US Bank's five core values is we do the right thing. And so I think that it is really important. I, I probably one of my weaknesses as a professional and a person is patience. So sometimes I'm like, can't we just get this through? Can't we just get this live? Um, but at the end of the day, we do the right thing and, and being a very ethical company, it is very important that we do a good job with targeting, um, that we are doing everything the right way. And so really risk, I look at as a partner and a partner to really help us make sure that we're doing the right thing. I don't look at them as a barrier or a hindrance. Um, and they certainly keep us out of trouble um, and help us, you know, honestly, probably get better results because they really look at the whole market. Yeah, that's great. I mean, audience targeting can be so uh, creative and so sophisticated that um, there's so many variations and segmentation that we can place. Um, and every brand really has its own kind of nuances and its own restrictions. So um, I, I could see that being a challenge for sure. And be happy to hear that there are, there's always solutions. So it's just being creative and um, really keeping track of everything that needs to be considered. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And as the area um, of FinTech is growing over the last few years, we've touched base on this before, um, the, the regulations are changing. Um, customer experiences are changing. What kind of experiences have you noticed consumers are looking for now? And, and how is U.S. Bank building on these experiences? 
Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things to me is just the growth and people talking about personal finance, right? Whether that's talking about it online, whether that's talking about it at, at dinner with friends, right? So, you know, back in the day when I was growing up, you know, you never talked politics, religion, money. And now I just think that it has become not an open secret, but just an open topic, right? It's it's just as appropriate to talk about finances um, as it is to talk about many other topics. And so we see that things like the personal finance section of TikTok is just overwhelmingly successful. Um, U.S. Bank does not do a lot of organic TikTok, um, but one of the things that, that financial institutions have there is just to make sure that all the information being put out there is, is accurate, right? So I'm not here to talk about political misinformation or anything, but some of the content creators, you know, they're not financial experts or in the case of things like cryptocurrency, they might say, you know, invest here. I made so much money. Well, these people are coming in so much later and they're not going to have the same result, right? I just saw today um, that Celsius has filed for bankruptcy and that there's over a million customers um, that aren't going to get their money back. So, you know, there, there's definitely risk there and I'm not trying to pick on, on cryptocurrency at all. I just mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a topic a lot of people are engaging with. Um, so where U.S. Bank really tries to position themselves there is to just be a really, um, um, financially accurate, um, a little bit risk adverse in terms of everything's approved by risk. Um, it's kind of place for people to come and learn. And so one of the areas that we've done really, really well is, is Pinterest pins. So we've done a lot with sort of how can you better yourself financially um, on Pinterest, a lot of education. And then we also have a, a content site called Financial IQ, um, where we have all sorts of topics, whether that's wealth management, whether that's starting um, or maintaining a small business, whether that's purchasing a home, whether whether that's saving up for a wedding or um, we have really specific topics such as um, you know saving up for surrogacy or infertility treatment so we can go very broad or very um, specific and we find that that actually our, our secret sauce there is actually SEO so what I've been surprised to learn is just how often people are just searching for things, you know, like how do I afford surrogacy treatment, for example. Um, and that's a topic then where we maximize all of our articles on financial IQ. And a lot of people, a big part of our traffic is driven by people just searching and us just being a really reliable, highly ranked um, authority, authority on these topics. Um, so we've really found that things like email marketing, providing information there, financial IQ drawing in people that maybe have never heard of US Bank, maybe they just look at it as, oh, this is just another blog, but it's a blog that I trust. Um, or, you know, really, really reliable information on social media. Uh, people are just looking to gain financial acumen. They're looking to actively invest. We know that more people than ever are, are entering the market, um, you know, and you only need, you know, you could invest with $25. Um, so people are looking to get in um, and, and learn. And so really we, we position ourselves as, as a place to offer financial education. But I just think as a whole, I just think that personal finance is really an emerging topic. If you look at health and wellness and fitness, personal finance now has a similar um, interest, a similar sort of engagement, um, which it certainly, you know, five to 10 years ago, it still felt very, very quiet. You know, I would never talk about salary or talk about money, you know, even with my closest friends. And, and now it feels like I'm like, you should ask for more, even if I don't know their industry. I'm like, where are you at? Do you feel like you're with your male peers? Um, you know, what, what, you know, and, and say, you know, the worst you can say in a salary negotiation, the worst they can say is no. So really opening up those conversations. Yeah, I definitely have seen that as well, where we're more open and comfortable talking about finances um, and just more savvy when it comes to saving and just retirement planning, um, just talking about investments. And I feel like that's become more in the far forefront um, rather than someone, uh, people who haven't really thought about that uh, in the past. It's just something that happened when you were old and we didn't have to worry about it now, yeah. Um, yeah. but we do. And there's a lot to be made for starting to invest very early, right? If the if you invest in your 20s, you know, that compound interest, you're going to be so much better off. So um, I think that there's just, you know, there's advantages certainly to, to financial institutions and fintechs to, to get people in, um, you know, and, and to make them profitable customers. But there's also a real advantage for those customers um, to be savvy investors, to, to learn um, and, and evolve, you know, so that, you know, by the time you're 55, you know, you're, you're very well on your way to retirement. Or for some people, you know, they retire early because of, because of their investments. That said, I have no investment advice for anyone. <laughs> U.S. <laughs> Bank would want me probably to say that, but I also have no personal investment advice. So don't take anything I said, invest in whatever you think you should invest in or go out to Financial IQ um, and learn more about personal finance just in general. They also do not have, you know, investment advice. Um, that, that's, not, that's not sort of the place that we feel we should, we should operate in. That is also risk recommendations. Um, you know, we would never say invest in these two stocks, anything like that. 
Um, well, speaking of advice, um, what would you give um, as advice to other women in marketing who are looking to succeed? Not financial, but career-wise. Um, what, like, going back to when you were like 15, I don't, uh, 15 years ago, uh, when you were just starting out, what would you give? What advice would you give to a younger self, and that other women can use um, to get ahead? Yeah, I think, I think there's sort of two big pieces of advice. One is just, you know, be your authentic self, right? If, if you are, whatever that is, I, I'm an introvert, right? If, if you're an introvert, if you're an extrovert, um, if you get your energy from really creative projects, if you love spreadsheets, right? Like bring your authentic self to work um, and really lean into your strengths. And it's okay to share with your manager, share with, with your team what your strengths are, right? Um, I manage to people's strengths. If, if, you know, if something is your weakness, I don't think that it's necessary that you become the best on the team. Um, so I think, you know, know what your strengths are and know who you are. Um, but I also just think that right now, I think that there's a lot of com compassion fatigue. Um, there's just a lot of burnout and people have just been pressed from all sides, right? They're pressed from their job. They're pressed from child care and child raising. They might be pressed from caregiving for older family members or parents. Um, and so I always try to really assume positive intent. So if, if I try to lead with, with radical empathy, um, but also really assume positive intent. So if I have an interaction and somebody seems a little bit off or, you know, oh, I don't know why you said that to me that way on teams. I always sort of just assume that everybody's operating from positive intent. Everybody is always trying to do their best. Um, and so trying to be sort of more patient, more kind, more compassionate. And I find that that gets better results, right? When people feel that they can be vulnerable around you, when people feel that they can share what they're struggling with, um, especially what they're struggling with professionally, I find that, you know, you can build rapport and, and just sort of drive better results. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, of sort of, you know, moments where people are just really frustrated and I think a lot of that doesn't have to do with work. It just has to do with kind of the time we're living in. It's challenging. It's hard. The news cycle, it can feel very dark or dire. Um, and so that's really my advice. It's just sort of always assume positive intent. Um, always assume that people are really trying to, to, be, to be good and, and to work for it for the good of the company. I, I love that. I definitely agree. I think positivity and empathy is so important these days. And I always have this saying that my grandmother would, would actually say, it's like, you get more bees with honey than with a stick. So, you know, I always remind that it's to myself. True, though. It is. No, I love that. And it's like, you and know, I think can... it... go ahead. No, you, no, you go ahead. No, we're oh, saying no, the same thing. Say... <laughs> I was going to say, we spend so much time at work working with our people more so than at home that it's so important to be, to have that positive environment. Yep. No, absolutely. And also it's okay to say if you are struggling too, right? So, you know, I find that that struggles are a part of life. And I think that it's okay to, to raise your hand and ask for help. It's okay to let your manager, let your team know, let your mentor know, you know, hey, do you have any strategies? I'm, I'm going through something right now. This has been really hard. Um, and I'll even reach out to agency people that just say, you know, hey, I just know like kind of, I've noticed like a slight difference in you. You just seem different. Like, is everything okay? Um, and sometimes they're like, you know what? Things aren't okay. I'm really overwhelmed or, you know, this just, this I'm struggling with. And I find that, you know, it's okay just to, to not be okay. Um, and I think that that was really probably something that I 15, 20 years ago did not feel that it was okay to be that way. You know, like, I'm just going to tamp all this down. I'm not going to share anything that I'm struggling with. You know, it's, it's almost like a fake it till you make it. And, and I'm saying, be kind, be positive, but I'm not saying fake it till you make it. I'm saying that that will not get you anywhere. Um, and I think, especially as women, at times we were encouraged to wear a mask, you know, not show our emotions, not show what we're struggling with. Um, and so I say, you know, take that mask off, be authentic. Um, I've done it. And, and I actually find that people react more authentically to you and more positively when, when you really are your true authentic self. 100%. Well, I know we're coming close to the end of our session. So if our viewers have any questions, please use the Q&A to put your questions in. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Katie, one last question I have, I have for you. Um, what are your FinTech industry projections in marketing for the rest of 2022 um, and 2023? Yeah, one of the things that I'm really interested in is just the copycatting of TikTok. So, you know, it just seems like every social media platform is trying to be TikTok. TikTok had such amazing organic growth starting, you know, really from early 2020 um, when everybody was at home, but now it's sort of a center of people find a lot of joy on it. It's silly. It makes them laugh. They're very engaged there. Um, so I'm very intrigued to say, to see, you know, how are the other platforms going to stand out? Are they going to stand out? You know, are we going to see LinkedIn be more like TikTok? I mean, that just seems 
ludicrous, but, you know, I'm just really intrigued by kind of where is social media going, um, you know, and then obviously adding to that the metaverse. I'm, you know, a lot of brands have been early adopters. U.S. Bank will never be an early adopter for new technology because we want to wait, see how it works, ensure that it's safe um, from a cybersecurity perspective and data perspective. Um, but I'm really intrigued to see kind of what brands are going to do next out there because there's been some really incredible things. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Katie. I really appreciate your time. Thank you to our viewers. And it was a great time um, speaking with you, Katie.